This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. All right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Closer Look. Uh, a Closer Look does look a little different today. Unfortunately, uh, we had a slight issue. Clayton had a personal issue that he had to deal with, so um, I'm going to monologue uh, A Closer Look this week. And hopefully we'll be able to get back into our normal content routine later this week. Um, But that's the situation today. So let's continue talking about Acts chapter 9. This is right after Saul has this supernatural road to Damascus kind of experience. And in this experience, he loses his sight. And losing sight, deaf, blind, or mute are all very key um, diseases, illnesses, uh, situations of existence in the ancient world. And so Saul loses his sight. And it's one of the most primary things that a person has, their sight, right? Their senses are one of the most primary things in which they experience the world. And so to lose that is a big moment. And then... The text goes on to say that when he regains his sight, it's almost as if scales fell from his eyes. This is uh, verse 18 of chapter 9. And so, he has this experience where it's almost as if it's a conversion of sorts, but I I struggle calling it that, but that's kind of what it is. It is a conversion. A conversion, but people have taken a, quote unquote Paul's conversion uh, to a lot of unhealthy places. I think, for instance, one of those being that Saul, the Hebrew, the Jew, converted to Paul, the Christian. No, Paul's a Jew. Paul will always be a Jew. He has always been a Jew. That is who he will and continues to be. Uh, no, Paul's a Jew. Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is his Greek name. Um, and so, yes, it is a conversion-esque experience, and Paul does believe that he met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so, what does he do? He takes some, some time, and he regains his strength. It's the final verse right before the text that we're going to look at today. Um, the text says, for several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the Son of God. Now, the thing that I want you to notice about this, every time the Christians have a public venue, it's in the synagogues. These people are not trying to leave Judaism. They think that they are part of Judaism. They believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of Judaism. And so they're trying to stay within the confines of Judaism. But Judaism kicks them out. They're too different. And so Paul begins, or Saul begins to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying that he is the Son of God. This is the same thing that got Jesus killed. Um, this is the same thing that got Stephen killed by Paul or by Saul. To say that Jesus is the Son of God is to make a very, very large claim um, upon who Jesus is and the divinity in which uh, he has. And so... Saul does a complete 180. He's not doing anything anymore except preaching and proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. The same narrative that he was previously persecuting. So he's been hanging out with them, and this is what the text says. All who heard him were amazed. Why are they amazed? 
I think they're amazed because they know who he is. The following verses say, Is this not the man who wreaked havoc in Jerusalem? And is he not here to do the same thing? They're amazed because Saul is different. Something about him has changed. That is, I think, what the heart of quote-unquote conversion is. If you were going to try to narrow down conversion, conversion into being Christian is to say that, hey, I was living a certain way, and I think that way is wrong because that way stands into the stands in contradiction to the message of Jesus the way that I read it, which is this. And so I'm going to change, and I'm going to live my life dedicated to following the life and message of Jesus. That, that simple thing is conversion. Now, everybody reads the story of Jesus a little bit differently. So, therefore, everybody has a little bit different, a little bit different of an interpretation of what it means to follow the message of Jesus. But this is what Saul is converting to. They are amazed because they know who he was or they know who he uh, is notorious for being and how he's acting and treating people now. This is uh, quite a monumental sight to see, I might imagine. As someone who came to persecute people and then begins to teach and proclaim the message that he was persecuting them for? Seems a little suspect. There's a supernatural element to this that cannot be explained. Um, A divine intervention, a theophany, a, a revealing of God. And... The reason that I bring all this up is because the next verse and the following verses I think are the most important in this uh, section of the text, which is verse 22 says, Saul became increasingly more powerful. But I thought Paul already was powerful. I thought Saul was already powerful. Didn't he come with men? Didn't he come with orders from the Sanhedrin? I think Paul was quite powerful already. But the problem is it's the wrong kind of power. I really do think this is the conversion moment, is when you decide that, hey, the power that I've been pursuing is no longer the power that I want to pursue and live according to. I don't want to continue living according to this power of myself, prestige, wealth. Nothing necessarily inherently wrong with those things. Um, But it does appear that it's the metaphor through which Luke has chosen to communicate Saul's conversion is through a metaphor of power and prestige, which has been communicated through Jesus' own words to Ananias earlier in chapter 9, that Saul will suffer for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the name of Christ. You can't miss the dichotomy between power and suffering and the powerful causing persecution and the Christians enduring suffering. I absolutely think that's what Luke's trying to draw out. Don't forget that Luke is the gospel writer uh, who we affectionately say is the Luke is the gospel for the outcast, the vulnerable, the oppressed, the marginalized. Absolutely, it makes sense that power and suffering would be the metaphor through which Luke chooses to communicate this for Saul. And he's not done. That's the crazy part. He's not done communicating it. He even keeps going in the way that Saul escapes Damascus. And yes, I say escapes. This is what the text says. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. 
Anybody else remember a time when the Jews plotted against someone to kill them? Jesus? I think you should have similar like thoughts ring in your head. Um, Saul is about to be persecuted for the same message that he was once persecuting and for the message of Jesus and doing the same things that Jesus did. So you definitely have this parallel storytelling of sorts that I don't think we should easily overlook. Um, but this parallel storytelling, well, I do think you have this parallel storytelling between Jesus and Paul or Saul. And I think Luke carries it well. And I also think that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't miss that when Paul says, "Imitate me, for I imitate Christ." Uh, I actually do think Paul tried to the best of his ability to imitate Christ, and I think Luke is laying that out for you here. But this is the part that I want you to take away. Verse 25, but his disciples, look, he's been here long enough to have his own disciples now, his disciples, people that he is training up in the way of Jesus. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. I don't know if there's... a more persecuted, oppressed way to leave a city. In a basket. Maybe in a coffin. But overall, he's not even leaving under the power of his own two feet because he can't walk out the front door. He's a persecuted person. He can't go through the gate. So he has to go in stunt-like scenes being lowered down in a basket. This is a man who rolled up in chariots of wealth on his way here, and he's leaving in a basket. Guys, I don't think we can miss that sometimes, sometimes, it's hard to be a Christian. It's definitely hard, and it's definitely, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to be a Christian. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to exist in the world. Sometimes it's hard to be anything. But I do know that for whatever reason, Paul thought it was a, a shift worth having. Paul thought it was a change in himself that was worth experiencing and living out. I think at this point he probably could have retracted his statements. He could have quit. But he believed his message. And so something happened to Saul. Some kind of conversion moment, kind of meeting with Jesus, and his life forever changed. His life forever changed. And it's because he started pursuing the power of Jesus and not the power, excuse me, of himself and trying to prove himself, excuse me, prove himself to God. When Paul quotes his own accolades in Philippians 3, he calls himself a zealot. He says, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. A zeal or a zealot, to have zeal, or a zealot, a person of zeal, um, is a person who is trying to prove their love to God trying to show honor back to God with their life. That's a zealot. So Paul, or Saul, in trying to be a zealot, in trying to prove how much he loves God, he persecuted the church. It's the difference between acting on your own power and acting on Jesus' power. If people are persecuted... 
you're not acting on the power of Jesus. Jesus came to liberate, not to oppress. If we are acting on our own power, we aren't liberating. We're oppressing. If we're acting under the power of Jesus, we are liberating. And so, church, I think that is what the conversion is. The conversion is to say, I'm no longer going to act on my own power. I'm no longer going to do the things that I do in pursuit of power. I'm going to be in pursuit of divine power. The power of Jesus.